Gentlemen, distinguished delegates, the meeting of the committee is resumed. I would now like to give the floor to Professor Walid Khalidi, a renowned Palestinian historian and Secretary General of the Institute for Palestine Studies in Washington, D.C. He will give the keynote presentation on the question of Jerusalem. Born in Jerusalem in Palestine, Professor Walid Khalidi studied at the University of London and Oxford. His first uh, teaching position was at Oxford University. He voluntarily resigned uh, in 1956 in protest against uh, the British invasion of Egypt during the Suez Crisis from 1957 to 1976. Professor Khalidi was a professor of political science at the American University of Beirut from 1976 to 1996. He was at Harvard University, responsible for research at the Center for International Studies, a guest professor in political science, and head of research at the Center for Studies on the Middle East. He is a founder and a member of the Institute uh, for Palestinian Studies, a member of the Royal Scientific Society in Amman, and the Palestine Welfare Association, as well as the Friends of the Khadidi Library in Jerusalem. Since 1963, he has been Secretary General of the Institute of Palestinian Studies. He was an advisor to the Iraqi delegation to the United Nations in 1967, a member of the delegation of the Arab summit to the British government in 1983 special advisor to the Secretary General of the League of Arab States in 1984 and uh, main advisor to the Jordan-Palestine delegation at the peace talks in Madrid and Washington in 1991 and 1992. Professor Khalidi has written extensively and given many presentations in English and in Arabic on the Palestinian issue and uh, Middle Eastern politics. Among his books, uh, let us uh, mention From ha Haven to Conquest, 1971, Before Their Diaspora in 19, uh, of 1984, and All That Remains, published in 1992. He has published articles in the New York Times, in Foreign Affairs, and Al Hayat. Professor Khalidi is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He became an American citizen in 1991. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Khalidi, it is my pleasure to give you the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Ambassador Baji, for your very kind and generous words of introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Control of Jerusalem has been a source of conflict between the West and Islam ever since 638 AD when Muslim Arabs
captured Jerusalem from Byzantine Christianity. Except for the 100-year Crusader interlude in the 12th century and until its capture by Britain from the Ottomans in 1917, Jerusalem remained under Muslim sovereign rule for some 1,200 years. This is longer than Britain has been Norman and more than twice the length of time since Columbus discovered America. It is longer than Jerusalem was under Jewish sovereign rule in biblical times. Historically, there never was a conflict between Islam and Judaism over Jerusalem. On the contrary, under the protection of Islam, Jews returned to Jerusalem after having been expelled from it, first by the Byzantine Christians and later by the Latin Crusaders. The Byzantine Christians had turned the Herodian Jewish temple into a garbage dump. A conflict between Judaism and Islam over Jerusalem developed with the advent of political Zionism. This was mostly a Russian Jewish nationalist movement which towards the end of the 19th century, long before the Holocaust, aimed at the establishment through massive immigration and colonization of a Jewish state in a country, Palestine, 95% of whose population was then Arab, both Muslim and Christian. With massive British help after World War I, and even more massive and continuing American help since World War II, Israel is what it is today. Because of this Western sponsorship, Israel's drive for exclusive control and super-privileged status in both West and East Jerusalem, and its determination since its crushing military defeat in 19, victory in 1967, its determination to turn the two halves of the city into what it calls its united, reunited, and eternal Jewish capital. These efforts are seen by Islam as the latest phase in a historical conflict and a latter-day Western crusade by proxy. Such perceptions were exacerbated by the resurgence of irredentist religious passions among Jews and evangelical Christians, triggered by the Israeli conquest in 1967 of the Muslim holy places in East Jerusalem. For the first time since the Roman Emperor Hadrian destroyed the Herodian Temple in 137 AD, Israeli soldiers swaggered on what they believed to be the Temple Mount. This activated the deep messianism embedded in Zionism behind a facade of secular socialism, stirring the hopes of Christian millenarians while confirming the West fears of Muslims. It is approaching midnight in Jerusalem. Some believe it is past the hour. What should be manifest is the extreme urgency and volatility of the situation in this intoxicating city. A prevailing Western notion, the crux of the clash of civilizations theory, is that Islam lies outside the Judeo-Christian tradition. 
This is nonsense. Because Islam's major premise is that it is integral to, and indeed the culmination of, the Judeo-Christian scriptural tradition. Central to Islam's concept of God's purposes is that he has revealed himself to humankind since creation through a succession of prophets and scriptures. Foremost among these prophets are the, he uh, among these scriptures are the Hebrew Torah and the Christian Gospels. Eighteen Hebrew patriarchs and kings are reverentially mentioned in the Quran. Islam gives David and Solomon higher status than Judaism does. According to Judaism, they are sinful monarchs. According to Islam, they are sinless prophets. According to the Quran, Abraham is a Muslim, the builder of the Kaaba, Islam's most sacred shrine in Mecca. Islam believes that because of God's love for Christ, he raised him up to heaven just before the crucifixion. Christ is thus alive today in heaven, according to Islam, and will return to earth, to usher the millennium. According to Islam, Christ was born of Mary, a virgin, by the direct creative act of God. According to the Quran, Jesus spoke in his cradle, healed the sick, raised the dead, miracles that the Quran does not accord to Muhammad. Mary is reverentially mentioned in the Quran more often than in the New Testament. Neither Judaism nor Christianity look the same way towards Islam. Judaism does not share Islam's reverence for Jesus and Mary. You might want to ask your scholarly colleagues how Judaism looks upon Jesus and Mary and where, according to Judaism, Jesus is today. Indeed, of the three faiths, Islam is the most ecumenical in its attitude towards the other two. Because of Islam's perception of its kinship with Judaism and Christianity, much that is holy to Islam and Christianity is holy to Islam, uh, to Judaism and Christianity is holy to Islam. And much of that is centered in Jerusalem. Thus, for Islam, Jerusalem is thrice holy. Because of its Jewish, Judaic, because of its Judaic dimension, because of its Christian dimension and because of its Muslim dimension. For Muslims, Jerusalem was the first direction of prayer, Qibla, before Mecca became their Qibla. Its holiness was further consecrated in a Quranic verse that describes a miraculous nocturnal journey, Isra, by the prophets from Mecca to Jerusalem. According to tradition, it was from Jerusalem that Muhammad ascended to heaven to within two bow lengths of the presence of God. This ascension is known as the Mi'raj. The prophets Isra to and Mi'raj from Jerusalem became the source of inspiration of a vast corpus of devotional literature concerning life beyond the grave. This literature is in circulation to this day in the languages of war more than one billion Muslims, Arabic, Turkic, Farsi, Urdu, Hindi, Malay, and Javanese. 
a very special link exists between Jerusalem and one of the five pillars of Islam, the five daily prayers, Salat. According to tradition, it was during the Prophet's Maharaj that after conversations in heaven with Moses, the five daily prayers became canonical. To commemorate the Isra and the Maharaj, the Umayyad dynasty, based in Damascus, graced Jerusalem towards the end of the 7th century with two architectural gems, the Mosque of the Dome of the Rock and the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which form with their compounds and walls the noble sanctuary, Al-Haram Sharif. The former, the dome, is the earliest surviving Muslim building, while the inscriptions inside the dome are our earliest dated fragments of the Quran. Down the centuries, succeeding dynasties, ruling from Baghdad, Cairo, and Constantinople, embellished Jerusalem with mosques, theological colleges, Sufi convents, abodes for holy men, orphanages, souks, hospitals, hospices, fountains, baths, inns, soup kitchens, palaces for ritual ablution, mausoleums and shrines. These buildings were maintained through a system of endowments. The revenue of entire villages in Palestine, Syria or Egypt were dedicated to these endowments. The donors were caliphs and sultans, military commanders and scholars, merchants and ladies of rank. In 1947, the United Nations General Assembly resolved to partition Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state with a corpus separatum for Jerusalem under United Nations trusteeship. The Arabs rejected the United Nations Partition Resolution in 1947. Why? Because it dismembered Palestine and gave the Jewish minority of 30%, 57% of the country, when this minority owned less than 7% of the land. The Zionist leadership accepted partition, but this acceptance was only verbal. At the same time, they prepared a master plan called Plan Dalit for the military conquest of the country, including the corpus separatum of Jerusalem. It is because Israel's control of West Jerusalem is based on the military conquest of 1947-1948 in defiance of the UN partition resolution that the international community has not accorded formal recognition of Israeli sovereignty in Jerusalem to this day. Within less than a week of the conquest of East Jerusalem in 1967, the Mughrabi quarter adjacent to the Wailing Wall had vanished together with the Abu Midian Mosque. The quarter had been consecrated as a Muslim trust by Al-Afdal, son of Saladin, for the benefit of pilgrims from North Africa. The Wailing Wall is known in Islam as Al-Buraq, after the wondrous mount which carried Muhammad there on the night of the Isra. In a pre-dawn raid, Israeli bulldozers surrounded the quarter and gave its inhabitants three hours to vacate their homes. That is how the plaza fronting Al-Burak was created. The regime governing the Christian, Muslim, and Jewish holy places in Jerusalem had been traditionally known as the status quo. This was the accumulation 
of practices, privileges, and constraints arrived at consensually over time. Unilateral action backed by military might to change the religious status quo in Jerusalem not only lacks sensitivity and prudence, but is courting disaster. Before the end of 1960, uh, June, June 1967, the borders of municipal East Jerusalem were unilaterally extended from six kilometers, six kilometers to 73 square kilometers of occupied West Bank territory. This annexation was in deliberate and calculated violation of the Geneva Convention. On the 29th of June, 1967, the elected mayor of Jerusalem, of East Jerusalem, and his councillors were read an order of dismissal in Hebrew by an army officer. Since then, under the rubrics of unification and reunification of Jewish Jerusalem, the Palestinian inhabitants of East Jerusalem have been subjected to a menu of siege, harassment, intimidation, isolation, discrimination, displacement, infiltration, fragmentation, expropriation, demolition, de-Arabization, and Judaization, designed to demoralize and overwhelm and hopefully induce departure, fulfilling a long cherished dream, Zionist dream, of an Arab free Jerusalem. All this has been meticulously and commendably documented by your committee on the exercise of the inalienable rights of the Palestinian people under the able leadership of Ambassador Baji, as well as by the European Union. Annexed East Jerusalem mushroomed into annexed Greater Jerusalem, which mushroomed into Metropolitan Jerusalem. Metropolitan Jerusalem now includes 634 square kilometers, or more than 10% of the West Bank. In 1967, the Jewish population in East Jerusalem was zero. Today, there are about 300,000 Jews on West Bank soil in metropolitan Jerusalem. If this is natural growth, Israeli geneticists have discovered a remarkable drug. Meanwhile, even as we meet this morning, the separation wall is snaking into, around, between the Palestinian neighborhoods of East Jerusalem, relentlessly, mercilessly separating thousands of Palestinian residents from home, school, hospital, relatives, playground, garden, shopping center, and office. Manifestly, the target here is the heartland of Palestine and its future Palestinian capital, East Jerusalem. Israeli colonization in and around East Jerusalem aims at geostrategic control, demographic domination, psychological browbeating, economic and social disruption, doctrinal affirmation, religious fulfillment, and territorial expansion. Above all, it aims at the preemption of a viable two-state solution 
and the crippling of any newborn Palestinian baby. Meanwhile, Jewish fundamentalists, abetted mostly by American evangelists, not only dream of rebuilding the biblical Jewish temple on Al Haram Sharif, but have also been plotting to do so. Plot after plot to blow up the mosque of the Dome of the Rock and the Al Aqsa Mosque have been un uncovered by the Israeli authorities. The most infamous of these plots caused the roof of Al Aqsa to collapse in 1967 through arson. This atrocity triggered the establishment of the Islamic Summit Conference, which today includes 57 countries, many of whose representatives honor us with their presence in this hall. At least 20% of Israel's Jewish population favors, favors destroying the Muslim shrines and rebuilding the Jewish temple in their place. To their credit, the United Nations and the international community in general never bought Israel's unification and reunification ploy. A continual stream of UN resolutions calls upon Israel to cease and desist and to comply with and abide by international law and the Geneva Convention and the wishes of the international community. We applaud your persistent efforts in this regard. But Israel pays no attention. Why? Because the only country Israel takes notice of is the United States. From my perspective of observation, over the decades, three deeply disturbing phenomena stand out in American decision-making on the Middle East. First, the increasingly influential role of the Congress in the actual formulation of Middle East policy and the continuing acquiescence of the executive in this process. Legislatures are too tuned to parochial priorities to conduct the foreign policies of global powers. Second, the steady retreat of successive American administrations from earlier principled positions on Jerusalem and on the applicability of international law and the Geneva Convention to Israel as an occupying power of the West Bank and the Golan. And third, the continuing disconnect, disconnect between development on the ground in the Middle East and the diagnosis of cause and effect by the American foreign policy elite, both in and outside office. Perhaps the most outrageous initiative by the American Congress on Jerusalem has been its endorsement in 1995 of the transfer of the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to a specifically united and reunited exclusively Jewish capital of Israel. This endorsement is already a public law of the United States, thanks to the failure of President Clinton to veto it. Ladies and gentlemen, triumphant Zionism has been increasingly in the ascendant in Israel and the Jewish diaspora since the crushing military victories of 1948 and 1967. This triumphalism is anchored in Israel's nuclear monopoly and in the American guarantee of Israel's military superiority 
against any combination of neighboring states. Israel has received a tremendous infusion of human reinforcement from the recent U.S.-sponsored mass immigration of a million ex-Soviet Jews. Thanks to this infusion, Israel can send colonists in the thousands into East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Golan. Israel derives vitality from the unstinting support of right-wing American evangelism. Its self-confidence is fed by automatic U.S. congressional circumvention of any undesirable initiative by the U.S. administration and by the automatic veto by this administration of any undesirable resolution by your Security Council. The American Jewish community, though not, not monolithic on the peace process in general, is virtually unanimously hardline on Jerusalem. Inside Israel, the principal leaders are engaged in a continuous outbidding competition with one another. Too often, the arena of this competition is Al-Haram Sharif. Bibi's disastrous authorization in 1996 of excavations beneath the western wall of Al-Haram Sharif was an exercise in outbidding Peretz and Barak on the left and Sharon on the right. Sharon's catastrophic invasion of Al-Haram Sharif in 2000, in the year 2000, which triggered the second intifada, was an exercise in outbidding Barak on the left and Bibi on the right. The asymmetry in the overall balance of power between Israel and the Arab world is compounded by intra-Palestinian disarray and by the absence of an Arab center of gravity. Soaring expectations were raised in the Arab and Muslim worlds by the new American administration. Presidents whose middle name is Hussein do not grow in plenty in American orchards. But the swift transition by Secretary Clinton from her categorical no to settlements, no to natural growth, to her gushing depiction as unprecedented of Bibi's moratorium which excludes East Jerusalem is not only a farce, but an unpropitious ogre of the future. With regard to, the, to Israel, the United States is not an umpire or referee. It is not a broker or passive observer. Jewish settlement in Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Golan is financed by unaudited official U.S. capital and tax-exempt private donations. It is defended by U.S. supplied arms, sustained by the U.S. mass media, shielded by U.S. diplomacy, and often manned by armed U.S.-born colonists. The U.S. is a major part of the problem and the major actor in the solution. Time, time, time is the crucial commodity. The Israeli exploitation of time is stunning as any visitor to the occupied territories can verify. Bibi knows America as well as he knows his face. A 10-month moratorium will take him to the doorstep of the next American elections. Mitchell is a superb diplomat, 
But the Irish conundrum is not analogous. It is not analogous. Why not? Because neither side in Ireland exploits negotiation time to revolutionize the demographic and physical landscape of the other. Robust, sustained, strong-willed presidential intervention in the peace process is not an act of charity to Palestinians. It is in the supreme national interest of the United States and a giant contribution to global concord. Clearly, the current incumbent of the Oval Office does not lack good intentions. But does he have the time amidst his other momentous priorities? And does he really have the leverage over a plus royalist que le roi Congress? Ladies and gentlemen, is an honorable and peaceful solution for Jerusalem conceivable? Yes, it is. It must rest on the following four pillars. One, the demystification and deconstruction of the Israeli and American concepts of the unification and reunification of Jewish Jerusalem. Two, no monopoly of sovereignty over both halves of the city by either Palestine or Israel. Three, no aristocracy, no aristocracy of religious rights conferring preeminent status to any one of the three Abrahamic faiths. And four, acknowledgement of the equality of the religious and non-religious dimensions of Jerusalem for both the Israelis on the one hand and Palestinians, Arabs and Muslims on the other. This concept of Jerusalem is based on inclusion, not exclusion, on sharing, not monopoly, on parity, not hegemony, on balance, not the usurpation of rights, on separate but joint governance. The unity that currently exists in Jerusalem is the unity of an Anschluss. If partition applies to the whole country, a fortiori it applies to its metropolis. The Israeli and U.S. congressional concept of Jerusalem is a guaranteed recipe for indefinite conflict, not only in Palestine, but far beyond. Our concept for Jerusalem could well become a paradigm for a historic reconciliation between Israel and its Western sponsors on the one hand and the universe of Islam on the other. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, distinguished delegates, the meeting of the committee is resumed. I would now like to give the floor to Professor Walid Khalidi, a renowned Palestinian historian and Secretary General of the Institute for Palestine Studies in Washington, D.C. He will give the keynote presentation on the question of Jerusalem. Born in Jerusalem in Palestine, Professor Walid Khalidi studied at the University of London and Oxford. His first uh, teaching position was at Oxford University. He voluntarily resigned uh, in 1956 in protest against uh, the British invasion of Egypt during the Suez Crisis from 1957 to 1976, P 
Professor Khalidi was a professor of political science at the American University of Beirut. From 1976 to 1996, he was at Harvard University, responsible for research at the Center for International Studies, uh, guest professor in political science, and head of research at the Center for Studies on the Middle East. He is a founder and a member of the Institute uh, for Palestinian Studies, a member of the Royal Scientific Society in Amman, and the Palestine Welfare Association, as well as the Friends of the Khalidi Library in Jerusalem. Since 1963, he has been Secretary General of the Institute of Palestinian Studies. Before their diaspora in 19, uh, of 1984, and All That Remains, published in 1992. He has published articles in the New York Times, in Foreign Affairs, and Al Hayat. Professor Khalidi is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He became an American citizen in 1991. He lives in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Professor Khalidi, it is my pleasure to give you the floor, sir. Thank you very much, Ambassador Baji, for your very kind and generous words of introduction. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, control of Jerusalem has been a source of conflict between the West and Islam ever since 638 AD when Muslim Arabs captured Jerusalem from Byzantine Christianity. Except for the 100-year Crusader interlude in the 12th century and until its capture by Britain from the Ottomans in 1917, Jerusalem remained under Muslim sovereign rule for some 1,200 years. This is longer than Britain has been Norman and more than twice the length of time since Columbus discovered America. It is longer than Jerusalem was under Jewish sovereign rule in biblical times. He was an advisor to the Iraqi delegation to the United Nations in 1967, a member of the delegation of the Arab summit to the British government in 1983, special advisor to the Secretary General of the League of Arab States in 1984, and uh, main advisor to the Jordan-Palestine delegation at the peace talks in Madrid and Washington in 1991 and 1992. Professor Khalidi has written extensively and given many presentations in English and in Arabic on the Palestinian issue and uh, Middle Eastern politics. Among his books, uh, let us uh, mention From ha Haven to Conquest, 1979, 